Well, good morning. Happy New Year. All right. What a way to start off a new year together as a body of Christ, singing together, learning from God's word together. Amen. All right. Why don't we stand together and we'll start our time off in song. you're with us, why don't you go ahead and have a seat. Happy New Year. It feels weird to say 2023 already, but 
We're thankful that you're here celebrating the beginning of a new year with us, and today we're celebrating God's faithfulness in this new year. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Greg Gifford, and I have one of the privileges of being our, one of our associate pastors here at the church. And I want to welcome all of you, especially those of you who may be new to the church. We've done a couple of things to try to help you out. So you see signage on campus, you see maps, things like that. But we also have a welcome table out here. And if you're new to our church and would love more information, we'd encourage you to check in there. And for those of you that are not new, we also encourage you to keep in touch with your Let's Keep in Touch app. So on your phone, through the church uh, app, what we can do is we can keep in touch with each other by simply going to the Let's Keep in Touch card and just letting the church's uh, office know how we can be in prayer for each other. So that's something to be thinking about. So I have a couple announcements for you today. First of all, make sure you mark your calendars and your alarms because next week we are going back to two services. So some of you will show up and you'll be able to see that next week as you show up at 10, we will be right in the middle of our 9 a.m. service. So be prepared. Next week we'll go back to two services. Uh, we also are honoring each first Sunday with taking the Lord's Supper together and then also collecting what is our mercy offering. At Faith Community, what we do is once a month, we gather a mercy offering that is reinvested directly back into regular attenders and members of our church, those that are going through a difficult time. So perhaps this has been a time of plenty in your own life. What you'll see is as you leave today, there will be ushers at the doors posted with little baskets to collect mercy offerings that will go directly to our mercy fund. Um, I also want to show you a video on carpet care. So if you have a second, uh, take a look up here. Look at all these grown-ups. Yeah, they're such slobs. Mom won't let us do that in our house. Good thing the church has old carpet. I heard the church is getting new carpet soon. Really? Wouldn't it be great if everybody took care of the new carpet and didn't spill their food and drinks all over it? Yeah, that's a pretty good idea. So if you want to spill your food and drinks on the carpet at church, get out of your system while we still have the old stuff. Or better yet, start practicing now and keep our old carpet clean too. Praise the Lord for new carpet. <laughs> Yeah, you know how it is. All right, um, none of us get excited about carpet, but when you get new carpet in your own home, you think like, okay, no drinks here, no food there. So this is not a no drink or no food rule, but it is just be cognizant. We're going to go through the big effort of installing carpet upstairs. And so just start thinking about that way, get into some good habits now so that once it's installed, we will be good stewards of what the Lord has entrusted to us here. So with that being said, would you open your Bibles with me? I'd like you to turn to Psalm 89. And as you're turning there, uh, today's theme is going to be on faithfulness, and Pastor Jeff's going to be preaching for us here in a second. I'd like you to turn to Psalm 89, and we're going to read the first 18 verses together. And then, as is our custom, we'll give you a couple of minutes to spend time together in prayer as we get ready to continue to worship today. So Psalm 89, verse 1. A mascal of Ethan, the Ezraite. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens, you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Selah. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord, a God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones, and awesome above all who are around him? O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. 
the world and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon, joyously praise your name. You have a mighty arm, strong as your hand, high your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are the people who know the feastal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face, who exult in your name all the day, and in your righteousness are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel. I'd like you to take a couple of moments preparing your hearts for the service. We've provided some prayer requests for you that God would continue to show himself faithful to you and that you would have eyes to see it. That 2023 would be a year of increased faithfulness on your part. And uh, we also are going to have prayer for our global outreach partners, Michael and Amber, that you'll see on the next slide. So take a few minutes.
Amen. Let's stand and we'll continue our time of just praising the Lord for his faithfulness to us. Amen. Reaches of heaven, starry heights, lights of the evening, dancing in silent skies, brilliance of morning, breaking day. Oh, let them praise him. Stronger than darkness, 
Whoa. 
Father, we come to you today with thankful and grateful hearts of just your faithfulness to us, God. Lord, as we look at this last year, how you brought us through, God, we can recount probably innumerable times we've just seen your faithfulness in our lives to provide for us, uh, to care for us, Lord, uh, to comfort us and strengthen us, Lord. We thank you for that. We praise you for that. Lord, we mostly just thank you for your son, Jesus, Lord, whose, whose wounds... Uh, whose bruises, all those things, Lord, were for our transgressions, for our iniquities, God. And Lord, as we go to this next year, Lord, may our hearts just be desirous to really be faithful to you, God, to uh, to to want to seek you and serve you more and better, God, and to be able to bring you glory. So thank you, God, for this time to worship you and to hear from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. vacation they have a, a schedule that they use so we're gonna have lunch at noon or one o'clock we're gonna go scuba diving at three o'clock and we're able to use the clock to base our activities on but here at Old Faithful we don't use the regular 12-hour clock that everyone else uses it's all about Old Faithful so when people choose to have their lunch or their dinner or their nap or their walk through the geyser basin all is based on when the Old Faithful is going to erupt so they can be sure and see it. Old Faithful is getting ready to erupt, so I am trying to time it. Oh, and there it goes. So I'm hitting the stopwatch and I'm, I'm noting the time on the atomic clock at 1258, which is pretty good considering that the prediction was 1259. So we're getting closer and closer. Now I'm going to measure Old Faithful. So as the plume of water gets higher and higher in the window, I'm comparing it to this tree right over here. And I'm using this picture, which has a triangulation set up 
to identify how high the water went on the tree. And what I figured out, Old Faithful's hit its peak already, was that it came to about right here, which is about 140 feet. So in the log book, in addition to the start time, I'm going to record 140 as the height of this Old Faithful, which is the tallest one today, which is kind of nice. And then all I need to do is keep an eye on the timer and see how long Old Faithful lasts. And that's all going to determine how we predict the next one. I'm also going to record the interval between the last Old Faithful and this one, which is 89 minutes. We take those intervals and we use those to make our average. Basically, we use observation Old Faithful to figure out how to predict it. And it changes through time. Um, just a couple weeks ago, we were using 88 minutes for a long eruption. Um, and now we're using 90 minutes because we figured out that that was going to give us the better average. So um, Old Faithful is now been going for 1 minute 48 seconds. It's still going strong. If it lasts longer than three and a half minutes, then we have what we call a long eruption, which is the most frequent form of Old Faithful eruptions. It's a bimodal geyser. It has longs and it has shorts. If it's going to have a short, I would expect that any minute now, it would just suddenly stop. If it were to do that, I would go ahead and predict it for 62 minutes, but it looks to me like it's probably going to be a long. Still a lot of water coming out of it. We're at two and a half minutes now. So we're going to wait another minute and make sure that Old Faithful is a true long. And we're getting to the point where the water's pretty low right now, so I'm going to be using the binoculars to determine the difference between the water and the steam. We won't consider the eruption done until there's no more water coming out. So we're still getting kind of big spurts of water coming out of Old Faithful. Most of the people have turned away now. And we are at three and a half minutes. So we're gonna consider this to be a long eruption, but I am gonna wait and record. Okay, and it's done. So three minutes, 42 seconds. So our start time was 12.58. So our next prediction would be go 1.58 and then go to 2.28. I'll write 2.28 in the book. And then the next thing I have to do is tell the world. This is 724 Victor with the Old Faithful prediction. Old Faithful Geyser is predicted to erupt at 2.28 p.m. plus or minus 10 minutes. Now you know how they know when Old Faithful is going to erupt. How many of you have gone to Yellowstone National Park and witnessed an eruption of Old Faithful? Many of you. Do you happen to know how Old Faithful got its name? Well, according to Wikipedia, in the afternoon of September 18, 1870, the members of the Wash Washburn Langford Doan expedition traveled down the Firehole River from the Kepler Cascades and entered the Upper Geyser Basin. Nathaniel P. Langford wrote in his 1871 Scribner's account of the expedition, it spouted at regular intervals nine times during our stay, the columns of boiling water being thrown from 90 to 125 feet at each discharge, which lasted from 15 to 20 minutes. We gave it the name of Old Faithful. So now you know. And 153 years later, people still come by the millions every year to witness an eruption of Old Faithful. Who knew that predictability could be so compelling? Old Faithful has a dramatic example of reliability and keeping to a schedule. But is there more to faithfulness? What do you think of when you hear the word faithful or faithfulness? How would you define it? I asked some of you in the weeks leading up to today how you would define that. Here's what you said. Number one, faithfulness means to be consistent, dedicated, true. Also, faithfulness is being trustworthy or dependable. It's important in certain situations like marriage, friendships, and with dogs. <laughs> Another said, God is faithful. We can know that God is sovereign and he's in control and we can rest in that. There's no need to be anxious. 
Another said, faithfulness means to be ever-present and trustworthy, fully reliable, like bedrock, foundation, consistent. Another said, for the believer, faithfulness is staying committed to Christ regardless. At the same time, it is possible for one who is outside the Christian faith to be faithful to things too. Another said that faithfulness is commitment. You find a way to get through the snags in the road. Your eyes are on the goal and you use all your resources to achieve that goal. There will be times of failure, but those around you help you get your eyes back on the goal. And another said that faithfulness is commitment, doing what needs to be done even if you don't want to, through good and bad, for better or for worse. Christians typically are faithful to what is good, but everyone in the world is faithful to something, whether good or bad. Now, each one of these definitions comes from somebody who, in my estimation, is faithful. And you can see the diversity of answer. To summarize what they shared, faithfulness is being consistent, being dedicated, being true, being trustworthy, being dependable, being reliable like bedrock, being persistent, doing what needs to be done even if you don't feel like it. So what do you think? Did they get it right? Is that how you would define faithfulness? Much more than just being an impersonable, impersonal, predictable activity like that of a geyser, faithfulness is a conscientious act of the will. It's a choice that we need to make. It's both an attribute of God and it's something that mankind is capable of practicing. And I do suppose it is something to look for in a dog. <laughs> so, you survived 2022. We stand here on the cusp of a brand new year. I want to call our attention to faithfulness, both God's and ours. What will 2023 contain? Any predictions? Certainly, there'll be plenty of things that we expect and plan for, but there'll be plenty of other things that we don't that take us by surprise. But whatever may come, faithfulness, both God's and ours, will be the key ingredient if we are to make the new year count. So today, my goal is simple. I just want to share two easy steps to follow that will help us stay faithful in the year ahead. Again, my goal is to share two easy steps we can follow in order to remain faithful in the year ahead. Now, kids, I made a handout for you. These are on the back table. If you didn't get one, please make sure you do. If you are faithful, I will be faithful too. <laughs> and anybody else who really likes Sour Punch Straws, feel free to get one of those as well. We have tons of these things left. Would love to share them with you. There's the handout for those who didn't pick one up. Okay. Step number one, I promise you two steps towards faithfulness. Step number one is to recall God's perfect faithfulness. This is the first thing we need to do as we consider practicing faithfulness in our own lives. We need to recall God's perfect faithfulness. In Old Testament, um, excuse me, in everything we should look to God's word for the standard of our faith and practice. Does scripture talk about faithfulness? Well, quite a lot actually. In your ESV Bible, which many of you carry, you will find 83 occurrences of the word faithful. And another additional 13 occurrences of the word faithfully. And another 76 occurrences of the word faithfulness. That equates to 172 times that faithfulness is mentioned by direct reference. And as I was studying, I realized that there are even more indirect references to faithfulness in the scripture. Sometimes the word is translated trustworthy, but the concept is there frequently. In our Old Testament, we find 71% of these occurrences. There are three main Hebrew verbs that, uh, terms that are used, emeth, amen, and emina, to describe the concept of faithfulness. The various meanings of the terms, depending on context, include the following. Sometimes it means firmness, or truth, or being reliable, or being trusty, or being steadfast, or having fidelity. This corresponds exactly with what you told me when I asked you to define faithfulness. God is certainly the perfect example of all of these things. Now, Old Faithful, the geyser, 
has an internationally known reputation for predictability, give or take 10 minutes, and allowing for changes and height and duration of eruption. But God has an even better reputation, that of unchanging, personal, real-time, perfect faithfulness. Let me share just a few of those Old Testament references with you to demonstrate that fact. In Deuteronomy 7, 9, the greatest of Jewish heroes, Moses, declared that Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God of Israel, was faithful. In Moses' own words, know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. And Moses would know just think of all you've been learning through Pastor Steve's series on Exodus over the last several months. When Moses stood at that burning bush and uh, he was given a seemingly impossible task, but that same promise keeping God faithfully sustained and empowered Moses to lead the Hebrews out of Egyptian captivity through the desert for 40 years and in position to enter the promised land. There's a spoiler for what is coming. Sorry about that. Moses found God and his word and his provision to be faithful and steadfast and trustworthy. In the book of Psalms, another key Jewish figure, King David, repeatedly declared that God was faithful. During a time of great affliction, David cried to God in Psalm 31.5, Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. And during a psalm of prayer and worship, in Psalm 36, 5, David declared, Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. In Psalm 40, 10 through 11, David declared, I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. Like Moses, King David, the human ancestor of Jesus, found God to be faithful in his times of joy and in his times of deep despair. David was so convinced and affected by God's faithfulness that he could not help but declare it to anyone who would listen. What an example for us. So, as we enter 2023... I ask you, are you entering 2023 with burdens? Do you have more questions than answers? Do you have a broken heart? Do you have unfulfilled expectations? Do you have a need for direction? I urge you to recall God's perfect faithfulness. I pray that you would pour out your heart to him for he is faithful to hear. And I'd like to give you even a few seconds right now, just in the quietness of your heart, just to pray and give your burdens over to the Lord. So let's take a few seconds and just do that. Amen. When I was a brand new Christian, a baby believer, didn't know anything about anything, realized that everything I thought I knew was probably twisted and wrong, uh, the guy who was discipling me put me on to A.W. Pink's The Attributes of God. Now, you can come up to my office. I have about 400 titles on the wall. This is easily one of the top five most impactful books that I own. I wanted to read to you a small portion of his chapter on the faithfulness of God. There are seasons in lives, in the lives of all, when it is not easy, no, not even for Christians, to believe that God is faithful. Our faith is sorely tried, our eyes be dimmed with tears. We can no longer trace the outworkings of his love. 
Our ears are distracted by the noises of the world, harassed by the atheistic whisperings of Satan. And we can no longer hear the sweet accents of God's still, small voice. Cherished plans have become thwarted. Friends on whom we have relied have failed us. A professed brother or sister in Christ has betrayed us. We are staggered. We sought to be faithful to God, and now a dark cloud hides him from us. We find it difficult, yea, impossible, for carnal reason to harmonize his frowning providence with his gracious promises. Ah, feltering soul, severely tried fellow pilgrim, seek grace to heed Isaiah 50 verse 10, which says this, Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. I urge you to recall the faithfulness of God in the year ahead. Our New Testament also has many references to the faithfulness of God. In fact, about 29% of the direct references to faithfulness are found here, uh, centering around two Greek terms, piston and pistis. As we look to the New Testament, not much changes in, what, in terms of what faithfulness is or how God reflects it. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 and 2.3.3 say that God is faithful. He cannot be otherwise because he cannot deny himself, which means his character will never change. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 through 13, says it this way. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Full, for he cannot deny himself. See, God is forever faithful with acts and promises that are true, reliable, and steadfast. Let me make this really practical by sharing two more promises about God's faithfulness that we find in our New Testament. These center around two of the most precious verses that I'm aware of. First, the Apostle John wrote in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Anybody know that one? Many. The verse occurs in a passage which states that Jesus really did come to earth and really was the Son of God who walked in righteousness and sacrificed himself on a cross on behalf of sinners, of which we all are. It goes so far as to say, if we say we have no sin, we're liars. God's wrath against sin must be satisfied. His judgment will fall upon sinners. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is just or righteous to forgive sin because Jesus' substitutionary atonement on behalf of sinners paid the penalty. In other words, he, paid, he, took the, he took our place. Sorry. In other words, he took our place. Because of what Jesus did, we have the means to experience forgiveness and not live under the fear of divine retribution. Aren't you thankful that God is faithful to forgive sins if we simply choose to confess them? We all sin and must genuinely confess that to the Lord, being assured that he will forgive. If you're here today and you have never taken God up on this promise, it is for you too. All of us who believe in Christ took God up on this promise for the first time one day, and it is for you. Confess your sin to him and ask him to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Let this be the first day of your new life not just a new year, but the first day of your new life, free from the guilt of shame and shame of sin. God will be faithful to do it. This is because of what Jesus did for you by dying, 
for your sin on that wretched cross. Let me share a second promise with you. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Now, this verse occurs in a context where Paul is warning his hearers not to underestimate the danger of sin. The verse just prior to this, verse 12, Paul warned, Paul warned therefore let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. History is littered with the record of those who fell who didn't think they could fall. And really, it's just the same old things recycled over and over again. Idolatry, immorality, grumbling, etc., etc. That's what tripped them up, and that's what can trip us up too. That's why Paul says in verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Is there really anything new under the sun? There's a whole book about that. Ecclesiastes. But God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Are you in the grip of temptation? Is your faithfulness being threatened? Aren't you glad that God hasn't abandoned you with no other outcome but to fail? He is faithful to give you the means to be faithful. Scripture is full of promises rooted in God's faithfulness. I gave you two from the New Testament here. There's plenty of them in the Old Testament as well. Often God called, and the Scripture will call them the covenants of God, the promises that he made to his people Israel. Before that, God promised Noah that he would preserve him and his family in the what? the ark in Genesis 6, and he did. Here we are. God promised Abram in Genesis 12, 13, and 15 that he would give his offspring a land that they could call their own. And he did. Joshua led them into the promised land in Joshua chapter 1. We can take our heavenly father at his word. We, he has a reputation for faithfulness. The same is true with the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who likewise has a reputation for faithfulness. Consider this, on the night he was betrayed, Jesus prayed to his Father in heaven, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So says John 17, verse four and five. Jesus was faithful to do all that he was sent to to do. This involved a great deal of humility, waiting, hardship, suffering, being misunderstood, and being slain. According to Matthew 26, 39, Jesus also prayed to his father in the hours before his crucifixion. My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Despite the mission before him, which Jesus knew about, despite the mission before him, being forsaken by his followers and his friends, enduring unjust court trials, being publicly humiliated and tortured for speaking truth, being crucified for sins he didn't commit, being separated from his father while he endured all of God's wrath for all the sin of all the world for all time, despite all this, Jesus remained faithful. I'd like to invite the men who be serving communion to come forward. We remember what Jesus did for us during the Lord's table. The Lord's table, or communion as we call it, has always been one of the central practices of the Christian church. It's been said... 
We are all equally poor at the foot of the cross. Christ's presence in our lives is the only thing that matters. Today and every time we celebrate communion, we remember Christ's death and proclaim it together publicly until he returns. We should come to this table in solemnness because we are reminded of a great because we are reminded of a great cost that Jesus paid to transfer us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. The Apostle Paul gives us a strict warning not to partake of the bread and the cup in an unworthy manner. So as the men pass the bread, or if you're at home joining us via live stream, take a moment to ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart for any hidden, unconfessed sin. Confess that sin, knowing that he is faithful and just to forgive it. Turn from it and be sure of the forgiveness you have in Christ. If you're not a believer, just let the elements go by. Or if today is the day of salvation for you and you've placed your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, know that you are welcome to participate in communion with us. So with that, I'd like to ask the men to distribute the elements. Go ahead and release the bread from your kit. And let us pray. Father, we're grateful for the promises that you've made to us through the word. We can read them. We can take them to the bank. And as we think about what Jesus did for us on that cross, we're grateful, Lord, that you are willing to forgive our sin if we confess it. Lord, we hold in our hand a symbol of Jesus' body broken for us. I pray, Lord, that as we partake of it, that you would be pleased to see us trusting you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Paul wrote this, the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat together. And if you would, please prepare your grape juice.
Let me just thank the Lord for this. Father, again, we come to you now just with grateful hearts. We realize that this symbol of Christ's blood is important, Lord, because it was blood that made us white as snow. It was his payment for our sin, Lord, that gave us the hope, salvation, forgiveness. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink together. Paul concludes by saying, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I would ask you to hold on to your cups until the end of the service. We'll collect them at the door on the way out. And unless you're in the front row, uh, check out that chair in front of you. At the bottom, there's a little hoop thing. It's for these. You may have never known that. I just figured that out two months ago. It's So Jesus remained faithful. That's where we landed here. Jesus remained faithful and during the cross for us. This same faithfulness of Jesus is woven throughout the, old, the whole New Testament all the way to the very end in Revelation where he is called faithful and true. The Apostle John wrote this, And then I saw heaven open to behold a white horse, the one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. This is our savior, our shepherd, and our king. He will be faithful to us as church. And he will also pour out the terrible wrath of God on all who oppose him. You see, evil thought it had eliminated Jesus when they pinned him to that cross. Well, stay tuned. You can finish reading Revelation 19 later on today if you want to see how it will actually turn out. We as the church of God have a great calling in this world and we will only succeed if we keep faithfulness in view, both God's faithfulness and ours. When things are hard or are going very poorly for us, there's nothing quite as encouraging as knowing that God is faithfully aware and willing to help whoever cries out to him. That's why our first step to be faithful in the coming year was to recall God's perfect faithfulness. The second step then is to respond by practicing faithfulness. We recall God's faithfulness, and then we respond to that by practicing faithfulness. Earlier in my message, I mentioned definitions of faithfulness that you shared with me. A few of you noted that anybody can be faithful to something, whether good or bad. It's true. It's true. People can be faithfully committed to things that are evil or ungodly. John Wilkes Booth became committed to removing Abraham Lincoln from the presidency prior to April 14th, 1865, when earlier plans for a kidnapping failed, Booth accomplished his mission at Ford's Theater by a different means. He committedly persisted on a course until the mission was accomplished. As someone once said, it's possible, possible to be sincere and sincerely wrong. When I'm talking about faithfulness, the kind of faithfulness I'm encouraging you and me to practice in 2023, I mean the kind of faithfulness mentioned in Galatians 5.22, which is a fruit of the Spirit, a fruit of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of believers in Christ. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. 
Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. See, biblical faithfulness is both an evidence and an outcome of our salvation. When Jesus spoke in John 15 about abiding in him or steadfastly relying on him and consequently bearing much fruit, the fruits of the Spirit were part of that. This is the kind of faithfulness that I'm calling us to practice. Now, as I look around this room, let me just caveat what I just said. I see faithfulness in droves. I see followers of Christ who demonstrate faithfulness in countless ways to me all the time. So please understand that I'm not standing up here saying you need to start right now. I'm encouraging you to keep on keeping on. Keep excelling all the more. I've been at Faith Community Church for 20 years. This has always been a place of faithfulness. And I pray that we as well will pursue that. May we give no quarter to unfaithfulness in our lives. No quarter. Instead, keep recalling the model of God's perfect faithfulness and keep responding by practicing faithfulness as his ambassadors of the gospel in the world. All right, so how do we go about this? That's the mission. How do we go about doing it? Let me share four helpful truths to keep in mind that may assist you as you practice faithfulness. Number one, faithfulness requires practice. So how do we start and maintain a habit of faithfulness? It starts with making a godly choice. Then another, then another. Every choice counts. What we say and think about and do are all choices, and those choices are built upon other choices. Let me say it this way. Imagine your heart is an apartment building, and you're the landlord, and you get to decide who lives there. Will it be grace or anger? Will it be mercy or revenge? Will it be impurity or holiness? Will it be generosity or greediness? Will it be truth or lying? Will it be sacrifice or selfishness? Will it be faithfulness or infidelity? Whatever is in your heart will influence the choices you make. For instance, during the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught in Luke 6, 45, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Our words are choices, and so are our actions. Choices are building blocks, and the string of choices we make becomes our practice. So may our practice be faithfulness. Number two tip. Faithfulness creates opportunities. When I was in seminary, we learned a lot about theology, biblical languages, preaching, how to study the word, how to build a theological library. And also, and I'm glad they did this, they made us stop and really think about what it meant to be a pastor in a church, just the practical how-tos of ministry. One such was that we should always be faithful with church finances and church property. One day, our prof exhorted us to never confuse church property with personal property. Not even a paperclip. Here at Faith Community Church, I have been trusted with your paperclips for 15 years. <laughs> Thank you for counting me faithful with your paperclips. It's a very, in my mind, it is a very serious stewardship. Now, the truth is that we all have paper clips to manage. We all have little decisions to make that demonstrate whether we are trustworthy, dependable, reliable, true to the Lord and to each other. Imagine these paper clips are pennies. Pennies are better than paper clips. Pennies of opportunity to demonstrate faithfulness. So each little choice you have is like a penny. Enough pennies turn into a dollar. Enough dollars turn into bigger bills. Bigger bills eventually turn into 
fortunes. If we can be trusted with the little things, we show our parents, we show our families, we show our bosses, we show the world that we are faithful with the big things, like driving a car, like getting a job or a promotion, like convincing somebody they should marry you, like serving in ministry at church where there are an awful lot of paper clips. Remember that faithfulness creates opportunities. This past September, I received a blog from our denomination, the Evangelical Free Church of America. In it, Pastor Kerry S. Doyle uh, shared an article he wrote called Every Church Needs a Tychicus. I'd like to read a little bit of this article to you. He says, are you a reliable person? Do you occupy the rare ranks of those trusted to carry out delicate duties with discretion and bless others in the process? Tychicus, one of the Apostle Paul's trusted representatives, was such a servant. We could stand for a few more today. Traveling and ministering with Paul, Tychicus was often sent by Paul to churches to share news and encourage them. He was a loyal and loved messenger, a faithful co-worker to Paul, and a beloved servant of the church. To get a flavor of the favor Tychicus earned, read what Paul penned to the church in Colossae. This is Colossians 4, 7 through 9. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and our dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. This, pastor, this article was written mostly to pastors, but I think we can all learn something about faithfulness from Tychicus. His reputation for faithfulness preceded him, and God used him in big, big ways. Tychicus was not the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. He's the guy who has like 13 epistles in the Bible. Tychicus has zero. But God used Tychicus in mighty ways. Paul trusted Tychicus to do the work of that mighty, to do the ministry of that mighty work. May our reputation be one of faithfulness and may it create opportunities. Letter C or number three, tip. Faithfulness brings delight. To me, the description of faithfulness that says, I do what I need to do, even if I don't feel like it, is how I would have defined faithfulness. Because often I don't feel like doing what I need to do. Hope I'm not the only one, but there are times when I just don't want to. But that doesn't change the mission I've been given from God or the responsibilities I have toward him or toward you or whoever. I must choose to be trustworthy, dependable, reliable, and true, knowing that it delights God and that it blesses my fellow humans. For example, Proverbs 12, 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. I can delight God by being faithful. In Proverbs 13, 17, a wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful envoy brings healing. I want to do that. I want to bring healing. I want to build people up, not rip them down. Proverbs 25, 13, a faithful messenger refreshes the souls of his masters. That's right. I want Pastor Steve to be happy with me and all my other authorities in my life. I want to refresh their soul. In Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but profuse are the kisses of an enemy. That's a good one, right? I think you can see the contrast here. There is a path of faithfulness, and then there is a path of unfaithfulness. The faithful person is pleasing to the Lord and receives God's blessing. The unfaithful person incurs God's judgment. You have to choose a path. So do I. May we choose to bring delight to the Lord and to others.
final tip. Faithfulness may not please everyone. Put this one last. Now, Jesus was the epitome of faithfulness to both God and man. He did what needed to be done every day of his life. Was he popular and celebrated and appreciated by everyone for his undeniable faithfulness? Well, it depends who you ask. There will be times when your faithfulness is not appreciated or understood by others. Perhaps the kids at school figure out how to cheat on a test. But you know you can't join them in it because it's wrong. Perhaps you're asked to lie about something at work. But you know your boss expects you to be reliable. Perhaps you have certain restrictions or medical issues that people don't know about or family obligations, or matters of conscience that prevent you from doing what others expect you to do. Faithfulness is not always the popular or easy choice, but it is the right choice. On a related note, can I humbly urge all of us not to judge others when they don't do what we think they should do? Do any of us really know everything that other people are dealing with? No, only our maker and sustainer know all the things going on in our lives, our health, our jobs, our families, and all the other circumstances that comprise our life. So may we choose to let grace reign in those times when we just don't understand why someone isn't doing what we think they should. We would want that benefit of the doubt, right? So may we guard our hearts and not let them grow bitter. At least, Lord, help Jeff Hell not to fall into the temptation of judging others. Maybe I'm the only one. All right, well, those are my four tips for a faithful 2023. So in closing, we stand here at the beginning of 2023. As I said earlier, we can't know all that the year will contain, but I wonder sometimes, what will people be talking about 100 years from now? I mean, assuming there is a 2123. What will they be talking about? Because think about it, we still talk an awful lot about what happened 100 years ago. Anybody know what happened in Egypt 100 years ago, in 1923? Howard Carter was the first person to lay eyes on the sarcophagus of King Tut after opening a burial chamber that had been sealed for over 3,000 years. People still pay museum entrance fees to go see King Tut stuff. In 1923 in Canada, the Eli Lilly Company began to mass produce and sell insulin as a treatment for diabetes. How many lives have been saved? In Sweden, the world's first domestic refrigerator was sold. So thank you, Sweden, for cold drinks. (laughs) Meanwhile, here in America, the first issue of Time Magazine was published in New York City. In New Hampshire, Alan Shepard, the first American in space, was born. And in 1923 in New Jersey, a man named Thomas O. Chisholm wrote a poem. The poem documented God's faithfulness in Chisholm's life, which was marked by health struggles. Chisholm shared his poem with a friend, William M. Runyon, who set the poem to music. In a few minutes, we will sing that poem together, which this year turns 100 years old. It's called Great is Thy Faithfulness. What a tremendous impact this famous hymn has had on the church over the last century as it describes God's daily faithfulness to us, how morning by morning new mercies we see and experience. One day we will stand before that very faithful God. And when we do, may we all hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Let's pray. Father, my effort today was to convince my brothers and sisters that you are faithful, but Lord, I suspect they already knew that. Every one of us who's trusted in you, Lord Jesus, knows that you were faithful to forgive sin and to embrace us, to call us brothers, sisters. I pray for those who are here, Lord, who have yet to take you up on your promise. I pray they would. I pray you would open their heart. I pray that today is the day of salvation, Lord, that they might know the freedom 
from guilt and shame that comes by trusting in you, Jesus. I pray that you would help us be faithful in the days ahead of this year. God, may we be beacons of trust. May we be comforters and faithful messengers and faithful friends. All these things we've heard about today, may that be us. And may we have a reputation for faithfulness, Lord, such that you can use us in mightier and mightier ways. We thank you for your word, which instructs and guides us. Thank you that you've given me the privilege of just leading the discovery here. But Lord, it's your voice that matters most. So Lord, help us to stay faithful to you and to listen to your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, let's stand.
Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. May you experience God's faithfulness today, and may you practice it in the days ahead. God bless you.